Hello, and welcome once again to our introductory series on the Divine Principle. My name is Reverend Philip Shanker, and today we'll be hearing our sixth presentation in the series. 2,000 years ago when Jesus taught, he wasn't able to reveal everything that he had to share. He said in John 16, 12 and 25, I have yet many things to share with you, but you cannot bear them now. He said, I've told you of earthly things and you can't understand. How can I tell you of heavenly things? But Jesus promised that the spirit of truth would guide us into a fuller and deeper understanding, guide us into all truth. St. Paul echoed this perspective when in 1 Corinthians 13, 9, he acknowledged, our knowledge is imperfect, our prophecy imperfect. But when the perfect is come, the imperfect will pass away. He said, now we understand in part. We see dimly through a glass, but then we'll see face to face. Now we understand in part, but then we'll understand fully. Paul emphasized the need for us to mature our faith. He said, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I spoke like a child, I understood as a child. But when I grew up and became a man, I put away childish things. The Bible is a living word. It has depth. It's not just information. So each time we revisit it, we can find more there based upon our own spiritual foundation. It is our hope that through this revelation of divine principle that you've already been able to gain many new insights on traditional aspects of your faith. Today, we're going to address one of the most important and traditional aspects of Christian faith that has caused great confusion and even separated denominations. Our topic is predestination. Let us begin. Predestination refers to the idea that our fate or destiny is predetermined beforehand by God. Now, theological controversy over predestination has caused great confusion in the religious lives of many people. Whether or not people are free to choose their own destiny, or whether God knows and predestines in advance the fates and fortunes of all people, is the controversy. Let's begin by examining where this controversy comes from in the scripture. In the Bible, we find many passages which are often interpreted to mean that everything in an individual's life, our prosperity or decline, our uh, good or bad fortune, even the rise or fall of nations, that everything in an individual's life comes to pass exactly as predestined by God. Among the scriptures that seem to support this, we find in the book of Romans chapter 8, those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Making it seem like God chooses, predetermines, and causes the accomplishment of those whom he wills. One chapter later in Romans, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So it depends not upon man's will or exertion, but upon God's mercy. And also in Romans 9, has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for beauty and another for menial use? And also in Romans 9, it is written that even while they were still in the mother's womb, God loved Jacob and hated Esau and announced their destiny, saying the elder will serve the younger. It's, it's true that these passages could provide ample biblical grounds to justify the doctrine that God absolutely and pre completely predestines human life. We would expect that since God is absolute, almighty, beyond time and space, that he, when he has predestined something, it is fixed and cannot be altered by human effort. However, looking at the Bible, yet we can also find sufficient evidence in the Bible to refute the doctrine of absolute predestination. For example, God warned the first human ancestors in order to prevent the fall. This in Genesis 13. You should not eat of the fruit of the tree, for if in the day you eat of it, 
in that day you will surely die. Now, unless God was using reverse psychology to tell them not to do something that he really planned for them to do, we can deduce from this that the human fall was not the outcome of God's predestined plan, but rather the result of human disobedience to the commandment. Again, we read in Genesis 6, 6, the Lord was sorry that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him to his heart. Here in Genesis 5, God sees the suffering, the evil and, and, and abominations in the world, and he repents that he made man on the face of the earth. Now, if the human fall were predestined, there would be no reason for God to grieve over fallen humanity who was acting in accordance with God's predestined intention. Likewise, it is written that whoever believes in Christ shall have eternal life. John 3.16 is the most well-known quote from the New Testament in the world. And it implies that no one is predestined to damnation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes will not perish, but shall have eternal life. And Second Peter makes clear that God desires no one perish, but that everyone reach repentance. There are many other biblical examples that God does not predestine damnation for human beings. In Ezekiel chapter 33, 11, God says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil way. For why will you die, O house of Israel? Going on in Ezekiel, the Lord says, If I say to the wicked, you will surely die. Yet, even if I say to the wicked, you will die. Yet, if the wicked repents, gives back what he has taken, restores the pledge he broke, he will not die. He will live. And here in Jonah, we find the record that God repented of the evil he was planning to do. God said to Jonah, I've seen the city of Nineveh. I've seen the unrighteousness of the people, and I intend to destroy the city. So Jonah went to the city, prophesied to the people that because of their wicked ways, God would destroy the city. The people repented, and God said, because they repented, I repent of the evil that I had intended to do to them. Now the Bible says Jonah got upset. God, if you don't go ahead and destroy and do what I said, my credibility is on the line. But here we see the dynamic relationship between the will of God and the responsibility given to man from the beginning. Jeremiah 18, if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it, but if that nation turns from its evil, I will repent of the evil that I intended to do to it. So, the belief that human outcomes are determined by human effort is even more supported in the New Testament, such as this verse in Matthew 7:7 7, 7 from Jesus. Ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Jesus many times emphasized the need for human effort. He said, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The Bible instructs us to pray for our sick brothers, suggesting that illness and health do not depend solely on God's predestination. If everything was predestined, why would we need to pray? Why should we make effort? What would be the value of human investment at all? Now, since there are ample grounds in the Bible to justify either of these two contrasting doctrines, controversy over the issue of predestination has been inevitable. Let us see how the principle can solve this problem. First, the predestination of God's will. Now, before discussing the predestination of God's will, let us first examine what is being willed. We know that the purpose of creation from the beginning is to fulfill the three blessings. Let us remember that God could not accomplish that purpose of creation due to the human fall. Accordingly, God's will 
being that God is eternal, unchanging, and absolute, the will remains. The will is eternal, unchanging, and absolute. And His will is still to accomplish the purpose of creation. Now, when God could not fulfill His will due to the fall, He determined to fulfill it once more through the providence of restoration in order to accomplish it. Another thing we can understand about the nature of God's will, God is a good God. He's the definition of goodness, and He's the author of goodness. God, therefore, did not intend the human fall or sins that obstruct and oppose His good purpose of creation. In short, God does not predestine that which is not of His nature. He doesn't predestine wickedness or evil. If such evils were the inevitable result of God's predestination, then He could not be the author of goodness. Moreover, if God Himself had predestined such evil outcomes, He would not have expressed regret over them as He did towards the depravity of fallen human beings as we already referenced in Genesis 6.6 or over King Saul, another example when Saul lapsed into faithlessness. Here in 1 Samuel 15, 11, I repent that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me. When Saul turned away, God regretted his choice. Evil is not the result of God's predestination, but rather the result of human beings failing to fulfill their responsibility and instead joining with Satan. So God, a good God, does not predestine evil. Evil results when human beings fail to realize God's good will. Let us continue. What then can we understand about God's predestination of His will? God is the absolute, unique, eternal, and unchanging being. Therefore, the purpose of His creation must also be unique, eternal, unchanging, and absolute. It is written in Isaiah, I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. Since God predestines His will absolutely, then if a person who has been chosen to accomplish His will fails or falls short, what happens to God's absolute will? God must continue to carry on His providence until its fulfillment, even though it may require Him to choose another person to shoulder the same mission. For example, God willed that His purpose of creation be fulfilled through Adam. Although this did not come to pass, God's predestination of His providential will remained absolute. Hence, God sent Jesus as the second Adam, and attempted to fulfill His will through Him. When Jesus also could not bring about complete fulfillment of His will, due to the disbelief of the Jewish people, God promised He would return. Jesus promised, excuse me, He would return and fulfill it without fail. Similarly, God's will was to establish the family foundation for the Messiah through the unity of brothers, Cain and Abel. When Cain killed Abel and God's will was frustrated and not fulfilled, God made a second attempt to fulfill it through Noah's family, who inherited that mission. When Noah's family also fell short of the will, God chose Abraham and his family as yet another replacement and worked through them. Another example. God also tried to fulfill His will left unaccomplished due to Moses' loss of his temper and failure. To fulfill the will through Moses, He chose Joshua in his place. And in, jo in the book of Joshua, clearly God said, As I was with Moses, I will be with you. And everything I asked Him to do, you must do. And all the ways I supported Him, I support you. And all the land I promised to Him, I promised to you. So Joshua inherited the unfulfilled mission because the will remains absolute until someone rises up to fulfill it. When God's will for Judas Iscariot as a disciple was nullified by his betrayal of Jesus, what happened? God made a second attempt to fulfill that will by electing Matthias in his place as the book of Acts makes clear. 
now that we understand that God's will is absolute and beyond human influence, let's consider the predestination of the way in which God's will is fulfilled. According to the principle of creation, God's purpose of creation can be realized only when human beings complete their portion of responsibility. It's the same then in the process of restoration. God's will to realize the purpose of creation through the providence of restoration is absolute and beyond human influence. However, the fulfillment of God's will requires the same accomplishment of the human portion of responsibility. Originally, God's purpose of creation was to be fulfilled through Adam and Eve when they completed their given responsibility, refraining from eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Therefore, in the providence of restoration, God's will is accomplished only when a central figure who is responsible for a mission completes his portion of responsibility, just as Adam and Eve were to do. For example, the people of Israel, as the central nation of the providence, should have believed in Jesus, followed him unconditionally, in order for God to accomplish complete salvation at that time. Because they disbelieved and failed to fulfill their responsibility, the fulfillment of the will was frustrated, postponed until the time of the second advent. Now to what extent then does God predestine the unfolding events in the providence? God's will to realize the providence of restoration is absolute. It's fixed. It's unchangeable. It is beyond human influence. He predestines His will absolutely. However, God predestines the accomplishment of His will conditionally. Why? Because it's contingent upon the fulfillment or failure of the human being's portion of responsibility. God has to rely upon the central figure to complete his responsibility. So, the fulfillment of God's will is contingent upon the central figure completing his responsibility in addition to the responsibility of God. Now, a proportion of 5% is used to represent human responsibility just to demonstrate that it's extremely small when compared to God's portion of responsibility. However, it's important to note that for human beings, this 5% is equivalent to 100% of our effort. Why 95 for God? Because who created the universe? Who established the laws of creation? Who gave us our nature? Who empowered us and gifted us with all of our talents and abilities? Most of the job is done. But here's maybe a better example. Think of your own life. Which of you has chosen to be born? The century, the country, the age, the time, the location of your birth, your parents, your environment, your talents, your abilities, your character, your physical features. All of these things are given to us. And 95% of our life is, in, is really predetermined. And this will affect how far we can go, how much education we can have, ex what we can achieve in our life. But what we do with this 95% constitutes our 5% portion of responsibility. There's a saying that who you are is God's gift to you. What you make of yourself is your gift to God. So again, for human beings, this 5% is equivalent to 100% human effort. Now, here in Revelations is another example. The Lord says, To him who is thirsty, I will give him drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit the kingdom of heaven on earth. I will be his God and he will be my son. Now, we can understand by separating this into the contingent parts. What God will give is the water of life, the truth the love of Jesus, the source of inspiration in life in order to support a person of faith. But it's the person of faith who must overcome the challenges and trials and then they're able to inherit the kingdom of heaven on earth. So, 
The question is, why did God give human beings a portion of responsibility? Well, it's the very basis of our value. God gave us the portion of responsibility so he could love us more than any other being in creation, so that we would have the free, creative, conscious capacity to respond in a loving relationship of parent and child. God's intention in giving this portion of responsibility was to make human beings worthy to be the lords of creation by having us take after God's creative nature. Now God predestined that his will be fulfilled through Adam and Eve when they completed their relatively small portion of responsibility. Similarly, in Noah's time, God predestined that his will be fulfilled only after Noah completed his responsibility by building the ark. Similarly, in the providence of salvation through Jesus, God predestined that his will be fulfilled when the people completed their responsibility by believing in Jesus as the Messiah and rendering him devoted service. So God predestines his will 100%, but its fulfillment is contingent upon human beings completing their portion of responsibility because that fulfillment of responsibility is the basis of our value and is the missing piece that caused the fall and needs to be restored in order for God to recreate man and the universe. However, time and again, human beings could not cope with even their small portion of responsibility. Consequently, God's providence has been repeatedly frustrated and prolonged. We can see that the time of Noah, the time of Jesus, and the future coming of Christ, these were all times when God sought to make an end to the evil world. But because of failure in the previous efforts, Satan could maintain his sovereignty. Over and over again, chosen people in the providence could not cope with their responsibility. When we consider this fact, we can appreciate how extremely difficult it has been for the men and women of faith to fulfill even this comparatively small human portion of responsibility. So now, given the absolute predestination of God's will and the conditional fulfillment based upon human portion of responsibility, let's consider the predestination of human beings. Adam and Eve were to become the good ancestors of humanity, conditional upon fulfilling their responsibility to obey God's commandment. He said, if you eat the fruit, then you will die. Therefore, if you obey my commandment, then you will be blessed. If you disobey, then you will be punished. Accordingly, God did not absolutely predestine that Adam and Eve would become our good ancestors. It was conditional. The will is, is predestined absolutely, but its fulfillment depends upon the fulfillment of the lords of creation whom God empowered from the beginning. Now the same holds for all fallen people. We become ideal people that God has foreordained us to be only when we complete our portion of responsibility. Therefore, God does not predestine in absolute terms what kind of people we actually turn out to be. The fulfillment of God's will through an individual requires both God's portion of responsibility and that person's portion of responsibility. Both must be accomplished together for an individual to realize his given mission and complete the will of God for his life. For example, God predestined Moses conditionally. If Moses fulfilled his responsibility, then he would lead the chosen people into the promised land of Canaan, as Exodus records. However, when Moses transgressed God's will, losing his temper, striking the rock twice at Kadesh Barnea, he failed. Consequently, Moses died unable to reach his final destination, and God's intention for him to lead the people into Canaan was never realized. However, that purpose remained, and the job was inherited by Joshua. Similarly, when God raised up the Jewish people, he predestined and promised that they would be glorified as the chosen nation when they fulfilled their responsibility to believe in 
and attend Jesus. Look at the promises in the Old Testament of Israel being the center of the world. Here from Isaiah, I will give you Israel as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. With their faces to the ground, the nations shall bow down to you. Then all flesh shall know that I am the Lord, your Savior, the Mighty One of Jacob. Many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem. In those days, ten men from the nations of every tongue will take hold of the robe of a Jew, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. This expresses God's foreordained, predestined intention that Israel be a light to the nations, having received Jesus. However, when their leaders sent him to the cross, this preordained destiny was not brought to pass, and the Jewish nation was scattered. Let us examine God's predestination of central figures in the providence of restoration. The purpose of God's providence of restoration is to restore completely the fallen world to the original world that God intended. Now that's meant to be realized originally through the fulfillment of three blessings. Those were left unaccomplished and God wants to restore this world back to that ideal. Therefore, although the times of their salvation may differ, all fallen people under the dominion of Satan, fueling this false world, are ultimately predestined to be saved. So you see them coming one by one at different times. Ultimately, the power that has allowed Satan to maintain his position has to be removed. For the Bible promises that Satan will be destroyed. Not the original being, Lucifer, but the position of an enemy, an evil one, has to be destroyed. Which is why 2 Peter 3.9 says that God desires everyone to reach repentance. Yet, as was the case with God's creation, His providence of salvation, which is a work of recreation, cannot be completed in an instant. It begins from one point and gradually expands to cover the world. That's why Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. It's the smallest of seeds, starting from a tiny point, but it grows into the greatest of shrubs. So in the providence of salvation, God first predestines one person to be the central figure and then calls him to a mission as he did with Abraham on the family level, Moses on the national level, Jesus on the world level, and the Lord returns on the cosmic level to restore all things. What qualification should the person possess to merit such a calling from God? On what basis does he call central figures in the providence of restoration? First, this central figure must be born into the prepared, chosen people. Next, even among the chosen people, he must come from an ancestral line with many good accomplishments. And among the descendants of this outstanding lineage, he must be endowed with the requisite character and personality to take on this mission, God foreknows. Among those with the requisite character, he must develop the necessary qualities, the education, training, and experience during his earthly life to prepare him for his mission. Finally, among those who have acquired these qualities, God selects first the individual, man or woman, who lives in a time and place most fitting to God's need. So finally, let us now elucidate the biblical verses which support the doctrine of absolute predestination. Let's look again at those biblical verses which seem to suggest that the outcome of every undertaking is predetermined by God's absolute predestination. The first one we looked at was Romans 8, 29 and 30. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. It seems to suggest that foreknowledge all the way to glorification and victory is predetermined by God. God, being omniscient, foreknows who has the necessary qualifications to become a central figure 
in the providence of restoration. Therefore, he predestines those whom he foreknows, whom he recognizes, are prepared. He then calls upon such a person to fulfill a providential responsibility. Now, calling the person is God's responsibility, but that calling alone does not entitle the person to be justified automatically. There are many central figures who were called and fell short of their responsibility. So they're not automatically given glory. Only when the person completes his responsibility after being called by God is he justified and glorified. Now, God's predestination concerning an individual's glorification is thus contingent upon the completion of the human portion of responsibility. Because the biblical verse doesn't mention man's responsibility, people may misinterpret it to mean that all affairs are determined solely by God's absolute predestination. But this has a lot to do with what Paul was trying to say to the Roman church in Romans 8 and 9. So here in the same passage, he makes the point again. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So it depends not on man's will or exertion, but upon God's mercy. Now, as we explained earlier, only God foreknows and chooses the most suitable person to fulfill his providence. It is God's right to choose a person and have mercy or compassion on him. This is the calling and it depends not at all on human will or human effort. This verse was written to emphasize God's aspect of responsibility, the power and grace of God's portion of responsibility because this was what the Roman church needed to hear. Similarly, in the same passage in Romans, has the potter no right over the clay? to make out of the same lump one vessel for beauty and another for menial use. Adam and Eve violated their responsibility and fell and lost their value. They and their descendants became like refuse, fit to be discarded. In such a state, fallen people have no cause to complain, no matter how God may treat them. That's the emphasis of this particular phrase. Also in Romans 9, it is written that God loved Jacob and hated Esau in the womb. And that God said to, Jacob's, uh, to Jacob and Esau's mother, the elder must serve the younger. But this is not prejudice. This is not favoritism. This is not predestination. If we look more deeply, God gave Isaac twin sons, Esau and Jacob, with the intention of having them stand in the positions of Cain and Abel where the elder son had killed the younger son. To restore that process, God intended Jacob in the position of Abel to win over his elder brother Esau in the position of Cain to recover the birthright. That's why God told their mother, the elder must become humble to the younger. That's the meaning of this passage, not that God was showing favoritism toward one or the other, like Cain. God's favor or disfavor towards Esau depended on whether or not he completed his given portion of responsibility. Look, for example, at what God said to Cain in Genesis 4, 6 and 7. The Lord said to Cain after his offering was rejected, Why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is couching at your door desiring you, but you must master it. Here's a classic expression of, humans, of the human portion of responsibility. God is saying, don't be upset that the offering's been rejected. There is a way for you. If you do well, I can receive you. If not, sin will dominate you. Your job is to overcome it. In fact, in Esau's case, because Esau obediently submitted to Jacob, he was able to rise above his previous condition of being in this position of being quote-unquote hated by God and receive the blessing of God's love equal to Jacob's. Conversely, even though Jacob was initially in the position of favor, he would have ceased to receive it had he failed in his responsibility. So in conclusion, there are many who've been confused about this point. Theologians and people of faith such as John Calvin have propounded the doctrine of absolute and complete predestination, that God controls everything, that there's no meaning to human effort. 
which is widely believed even in our present day. These ones have held to such a doctrine because they wrongly believed that the accomplishment of God's will depends solely on the power and work of God. They were ignorant of the true relationship between God's portion of responsibility and the human portion of responsibility in the fulfillment of the providence of restoration. Now, we've been able to see these things more clearly. I do hope that you have gained new insight into this thorny issue that has divided people of faith and Christian believers throughout the world. In future discussions, we are going to apply these principles we've been discussing to the entire history of humankind and understand God's providence of restoration and the age we are living in now based on the principle. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. God bless.